Beasley. We, we left off the, uh, the other day, Ron and Hermione become prefects. Harry's a little bit out of shape about that. He's thinking, you know, I'm the only one who's fought Voldemort, defeated him. That should count for something. And so they have the, um, the big party for their prefecture, as well as Harry's not being expelled. And Molly asks Moody to look upstairs to see if there's something in a drawing room desk, and he says, yes, there's a boggart. She says she'll take care of it. And then Moody shows Harry a photograph. Okay? He says, come here, I've got something that might interest you. He pulls out a photograph. Original Order of the Phoenix. Found it last night when I was looking for my spare invisibility cloak. <laughs> He's got more than one. It, you know, Book 7, it kind of sounds like they're exceptionally rare. And seeing as Podmore hasn't had the manners to return my best one. So Harry takes the photograph. And we go through and we see them all in this order. We have Moody, we have Albus Dumbledore, we have Dedo Stiggle, we have Marlene McKinnon. And what does he say? That's Marlene McKinnon. She was killed two weeks after this was taken. They got her whole family. We don't know how big her family was. So I've only listed her. Okay? She's the only one in the photograph. Then we have Frank and Alice Longbottom. Notice I don't have an X by their names because they're not dead. So we'll put a check mark. But they are incapacitated. Okay? Then we have Emmeline Vance. Harry has met her. What's going to happen to her? Okay? She's dead in the um, beginning of what? Book six? Then we have Benji Fenwick. He's dead. What does he say? Uh, well, he says about the long bottoms. Better dead than what happened to them. That's Emmeline Vance. You've met her. Oh, there's Lupin. Um, there's Lupin, Benji Fenwick, he copped it too. We only ever found bits of him. Now, you don't only find bits of people from a Nevada cadaver curse. So he was blasted to smithereens somehow. Or maybe we're being told something about the desecration of the body idea again. Okay. Edgar Bones, brother of Amelia, they got him and his family too. He was a great wizard, Sturgis Podmore. Karadak Dearborn, vanished, never found his body. Hagrid, Ophias Doge. Gideon Pruitt, it took five Death Eaters to kill him and his brother Fabian. Okay. Fate, they are Molly's brothers. Okay. Why does he say it took five Death Eaters to take them? like you don't want to piss off the Pruitts. What do we see with Molly in book seven? Not my daughter, you bitch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Aberforth's brother, uh, Dumbledore's brother, Aberforth. Dorcas Meadows, Voldemort killed her personally. What's that tell us about her? She was special. You know, it took Voldemort to go after her. Okay. Sirius. And then Harry looks. Well, in terms of incapacitated or dead, it's still 20%. And then Harry looks and he sees his parents. His mother and father were beaming up at him, sitting on either, either side of a small, watery man. Recognize that. Recognize that once as Wormtail. Okay? Wormtail's still alive. Not for long. Why, so why does Moody show this to him? Do you think this will lift Harry's spirits? Does he think this will be encouraging? Is this merely a history lesson? What idea? Possible. Something worth fighting for? What else does it do? It puts Harry, Fred, George, Ron, Hermione, to some extent, in a context. In a larger context. In other words, this is the original Order of the Phoenix. There's now a new Order of the Phoenix. 
Harry, Ron, Hermione aren't in it, so to speak, but I think what Moody is suggesting is you are in it, boy. Why? Because it kind of revolves around Harry. Okay? The, the original Order of the Phoenix was, was begun before Harry was born. It was begun before the prophecy. I think, I think the implication is it was begun during Voldemort's rise to power. It doesn't start when Lily and James and Sirius and Lupin start at Hogwarts at 11 years old. But it might have begun by the time they get to their seventh year. And Dumbledore already realizes some, some things about them. Okay? So, Harry looks into Moody's face. And Moody has this look like he's just given Harry a treat, notice. Harry, um, yeah, I haven't packed. You know, I've got to leave. Why? Why does anyone want to sit and talk with Moody? He's got to process this information. Again, what's he just been told? Half, half of the original order are either dead or incapacitated. So what does that mean about the present order? Take your pick, folks. Who's, who's going to die? Arthur, Molly, Sirius, Lupin, you know, are in the current order. Hagrid, Dumbledore, McGonagall is in the order. Siri, uh, Snape is in the order. Moody's in the order. Daedalus Diggle's in the order. Okay, Ephias Doge is still in the order. Hestia Jones is in the order. Kingsley Shackable. How many of those die? Well, we're going to end up with Sirius dead by the end of this book. We're going to end up with Fred dead by the end of this book. Excuse me, by the end of the seventh book. We're going to end up with Remus and Tonks both dead. It's, it, I don't think it's 50%, but it's a pretty good proportion. Okay. And notice, you know, book one, when Harry says, um, Voldemort's going to come back, isn't he? And Dumbledore says, Harry, you might have slowed his rise, but it'll take somebody else to kind of what? Be willing to fight to the death. We get that idea, fighting to the death, early on. Okay? Um, Harry leaves this room. That's not what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to go to your notes. And what does he see? He makes his own way on up to his room. And what's he see off in a side room? Molly Weasley. Dead Fred. Dead George. Dead Arthur. Dead Harry. Dead Hermione. Dead Ginny. Dead Percy. Dead Charlie. Dead Bill. Harry knows what's going on. Okay. Why does Molly keep seeing this? Well, it's the Boggart. Boggart's playing your fears. Okay. This gives us a little inkling as to what's, you know, Molly's state of mind. What is she constantly thinking of? Her family's got to die. Why? They're in the thick of it. And right now, where is Percy? He's not tied to the family. There's this huge rift in the family. And that drives her crazy. Notice the one positive thing about this. Harry sees himself. He, to Molly, is a son. Okay. Um, who comes and gives her consolation other than Harry? Lupin? <clears throat> Who else? How did Molly and Sirius kind of end their conversation earlier? You know, the first conversation, it did not end on positive terms. You get the impression Molly and Sirius are kind of at loggerheads. She wants to defend Harry. Sirius wants to what? 
sent free. Let him be kind of what he is intended to be. I mean, that's the way I read it. Sirius thinks Harry has, you know, abilities. We should be nurturing those abilities. We should give, be giving him kind of free reign and opportunities to practice those skills. Okay? She tells Lupin, don't tell Arthur. I don't want him to know. Don't want him to know what? What does she think about herself? That she's weak. Does this show Molly's weakness? No. What's it show? Just the opposite. It shows her strength. <laughs> Molly has a great ability just like Harry has. Love. Okay? She says, Harry, I'm so sorry. What you must think of me, not even able to get rid of a bogger. Don't be stupid, Harry says. I'm just so worried. Half the family's in the order. <laughs> okay. Going by the old statistics, it'll be a miracle if we all come through this. And Percy's not talking to us. What if something dreadful happens and we never made up? What if something happens to Percy or me or Arthur and they've never had a chance notice? What does she mean, never made up? Okay, so what is the family? Broken. It's not whole. There's an idea again of wholeness. She's saying we can't die divided. I think about the family as kind of being a metaphor for the body. If the family dies broken, then what is the state of its soul? It's ripped. Okay. She's kind of suggesting we've got to put our brokenness together. We have to end our divisions. The same kind of thing Dumbledore said at the end of the previous book. We have to mend divisions. We have to reach across lines, so to speak. Okay? Lupin, I think it is, or it's serious. Lupin says, Molly, this is different. This isn't like last time. The order is better prepared. We've got a head start. We know what Voldemort's up to. And then he finally, you know, she, yeah, you know. You need to learn to accept the name. Percy, uh, Sirius comes in. Don't worry about Percy. He'll come around. It's a matter of time before Voldemort comes into the open. Once he does, the whole ministry is going to be begging us to forgive them. And I'm not sure I'll be accepting their apology. I'm not sure I even know the answer to this. Does Sirius know what happened to Regulus? He knows Regulus joined the Death Eater. He knows Regulus was killed by Voldemort. Does he know why? Does he know Sirius? Does he know Regulus tried to come back? Okay. Lupin. And as for who's going to look after Ron and Jenny if you and Arthur died, what do you think we'd do? Let them survive? Okay. This is Lupin. What's probably going through Molly's head? Uh, werewolf? And serious, you know. So, next chapter we meet, we're introduced to Luna Lovegood, which we're going to skip over entirely. Um, and we're going on to, I think, the chapter after that. Notice Hagrid is not at school when they arrive. Harry's wondering why. And we get the Sorting Hats new song. This is the song I intended, you know, I was thinking of in the question for that previous exam. We're going to spend a few minutes on the song. Uh, by the way, if you haven't taken this down, write down the seat numbers. Uh, I'll remind us when we get to the train tomorrow. Um, notice there aren't a lot that are together. 3 through 10 in Coach D and 27 through 30 in Coach D are together. And then 51 through 56 are together. Most of the others are individual seats. Okay? You can't just take any reserved seat because somebody has a ticket that says that's their seat. Um, these two, I'm going to take. Um, 
because I'm going to need to erase that. So, in times of old when I was new and Hogwarts barely started, the founders of our noble school thought never to be parted. What does he mean by parted? What do you do when you part your hair? Separate. Divide. Let's use this word that the sorting head is going to use. Quarter. <coughs> when you're drawn in quarters, you're not literally cut into quarters. I mean, sometimes you were, but other times you were just cut into little bits and pieces. Okay? So, they thought never to be parted, to be separated. In other words, they always thought to be whole. United by a common goal. Okay? They were united. They were drawn together by an idea. That idea kind of was their soul, if you want to think of it that way. <coughs> What's the common goal? They had the self-same yearning to, wait, to make the world's best magic school and pass along their learning. Together, we will build and teach, the four good friends decided, and never did they dream that they might someday be divided. For were there such friends anywhere, when you first read this, who do you think is going to come? You think it's going to be Gryffindor and Slytherin? No. Why? Because they're the polar opposites currently. Okay, kind of, you know, Ravenclaw and Slytherin are polar opposites, and Hufflepuff and Slytherin are polar opposites too. Okay, but it's Slytherin and Gryffindor, unless it was the second pair of Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. Is she saying something? She, rolling, saying something maybe about the qualities of each of them that kind of draw them together. Gryffindors are bolding, daring, they show nerve, they have chivalry. Slytherins are cunning, they have ambition, they seek power. In order to seek power, don't you have to be bold and daring and show nerve? Yes, you do. Okay. So how could it have gone so wrong? That's the sorting at making a comment about the state of Hogwarts today in the novel. It's wrong. There are problems. How could such friendships fail? Why, I was there and so can tell the, soul, the whole sad, sorry tale. Now remember, first years don't know what about the sorting at. It was Godric Gryffindor's. We heard in the fourth book, Gryffindor whipped me off his head and they put each put some of their brains in it. So, uh, what is the sorting hat? Think book seven. What must Harry look for? Book seven. Horcruxes, right? <coughs> but what might Voldemort have used to make horcruxes? According to Dumbledore. Louder. Something from each of the head of the Something from each of the original founders. A relic of sorts. Okay. They assume, they, Harry, Ron, Hermione, the only relic from Godric Gryffindor is what? The sword. It's not. The sorting hat is also a relic. Harry should know that even before he thinks of the sword. Why? Because it's in the Chamber of Secrets that the hat comes on his head and squeezes out the sword onto him. It's a disgusting image when you think about it. <laughs> so, says Slytherin, we'll teach just those whose ancestry is purest. <coughs> Slytherin, pure ancestry. And notice how he qualifies. We'll teach what? What's the next word? Just. We'll teach just what? Just those. What does just mean? Only. So what does it exclude? Everyone else. Okay? So, just those whose ancestry is purest. Alright? Said Ravenclaw. We'll teach those, no modifier in front of it, 
We'll teach those uh, whose intelligence is surest. Right? But it doesn't necessarily, it's not as exclusive as Slytherin's statement. Right? Says Gryffindor, we'll teach all those who what? With brave deeds to their name. That kind of implies by the time you're 11 years old, you must have already done something brave. Who would that definitely exclude? First year of the Harry Potter novels. No. Okay. Bouncing down the sidewalk because your Uncle Alfie drops you from a window doesn't show your bravery. Harry? Yeah, because he's had to deal with Dudley. Okay? But notice, all those, is it still exclusive to an extent? Yeah. It is because it names this. Okay? We'll teach all the brave ones. It's not, as, it's not as exclusive because it doesn't say only those. Slytherin is saying, I'm not teaching anybody else. Okay? Hufflepuff. How does she exclude? I'll teach the lot. What's the lot mean? Every damn one of them. I'll teach them all. I'll teach just those whose ancestry is purest. I'll teach those whose intelligence is surest. I'll teach all those who have brave deeds to their name. And I'll teach everybody else too. The lot. Everybody in here has been in an elementary school class where it's been time for recess or PE, and oh, we have to pick teams. And what happens? The best get chosen when? First, and the losers, the dregs of society, are in the back and get chosen last. What's Hufflepuff saying? Take them all. Okay. I'll teach the lot, but she doesn't stop there. And then says what? And treat them just the same. She's going to teach them all equally. She's going to treat them all equally. In other words, for Hufflepuff, your ancestry doesn't mean diddly squat. Your intelligence doesn't mean diddly squat. Your brave deeds don't mean diddly squat. You are all equal in her eyes. Hmm. These differences cause little strife. Where are the differences? Here, here, here. <coughs> what about Huffman? Yeah, she's different, but how? She doesn't exclude. She doesn't, she use another word. She doesn't separate. She doesn't sort. She doesn't divide. She doesn't, and I'll use a new term, she doesn't work Christ. Think of what happens when first years are sorted. When the first years arrive on the little boat across the forbidden lake, uh, the, the lake. What are they all at that point? Louder. Same. The same. Okay, keep going. They're first years. That's what unites them, right? They're Hogwarts students, and they're pretty excited about being Hogwarts students. And it's like the minute they step in the Great Hall, what happens? The hat goes on the head, and they're no longer... Simply first years and Hogwarts students, they're Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff, Slytherin. What was once a single entity now gets divided. 
and what immediately happens once they're divided. I mean, first book, Percy, we got Potter. <laughs> you guys are screwed. That's what he means. We've got the one who defeated Lord Voldemort when he was only a little baby. <laughs> you guys are, you know. So, these differences caused little strife when first they came to light. For each of the four founders had a house in which they might take only those they wanted. But notice, Hufflepuff doesn't have a house in which she takes only those she wants. Her house is, I'll, I'll take them all, you know. But if she takes them all, what happens to the other three? They have no money. So, Slytherin took only pure blood wizards of great cunning just like him. And only those of sharpest mind were taught by Ravenclaw, while the bravest and the boldest went to Daring Gryffindor. Good Hufflepuff. Okay. Two founders receive adjectives. Daring Gryffindor, good Hufflepuff. Slytherin there doesn't have an adjective in front of it, and neither does Ravenclaw. But bravest and the boldest went to Daring Gryffindor, good Hufflepuff. She took the rest. Okay, who are the rest? <coughs> Louder, Justice. The last pick for the sports teams, or all those who none of these three wanted. Go back to what Dobby said to Harry when he was sitting on his chest in the hospital bed in book two. And what happened, he says, to our kind? We, we dregs of the magical world. Harry's coming was like what? Like a beacon in the night. Okay. What do you think all those who did not go off into this, these houses felt? Because we're not told necessarily by the song how the sorting occurred a thousand years ago. By this song, we're not told that. Like, first year, the very first year of the founding of Hogwarts, we're not told that Gryffindor immediately whipped the hat off his head, they each put some brains and said, hey, let's do it this way. Right? Might have been. Or it might have been, all right, and all you purebloods, come over here. And all the purebloods go over. All you, you know... SAT experts, all you GRE experts, you come over here. All you brainiacs, come over here. All you brave, daring, swashbuckling, sword-bearing, you know, Errol Flynn's, you know, come over here. You losers in the back there. Yes, you know who you are. Come on, step forward. You're with me, the old fat lady, kind of, as it is. So, good awful puff. She took the rest and taught them all she knew. We're not told what that is. Thus the houses and their founders retained friendships firm and true. So Hogwarts worked in harmony for several happy years. Describe several. How old is Hogwarts? It's over a thousand years old. Describe several. Okay. One is one, two is a couple, three is a few, four or more is several. Until you get up to a 20, then that's a score. So somewhere between 4 and 19. The school's a thousand years old. They could only keep it together, so to speak, for between 4 and 19 years. For about 15 years. What does that suggest? Is there a problem with humanity <laughs> that we can't get along? So, Hogwarts worked in harmony for several happy years, but then discord crept among us. What's discord? <laughs> Notice she's spelling it like this. Why? Because it's discordant. This kind of chord, probably. But 
this is also related to this kind of cord, as in cardiac type heart. Discord crept among us. So what's discord? Well, you know what dissing somebody is. So bad heart, al heart, malfaith, malfoy crept among us. Feeding on our faults and fears. Notice what perspective the hat is now talking from. Our crept among us. Okay. The, ha the, the school itself, Hogwarts, but I think also the founders. The houses that, like Pillars 4, had once upheld the school, so you have four pillars. The school is built upon that. Okay? The houses that, like pillar, Pillars 4, had once held upper school, now turned upon each other and divided sought to rule. The houses turn. Okay, notice, they're supposed to hold up the school. What happens? If you take this pillar and turn it, and then you take this pillar and turn it, and you take that pillar and turn it, and that pillar and turn it, the school has no foundation anymore. It has no underpinnings. They divided, sought to rule. And for a while it seemed the school must meet an early end, what with dueling and with fighting and the clash of friend on friend. And at last there came a morning when old Slytherin departed. And though the fighting then died out, he left us quite downhearted. Why? Why are they left downhearted? What is meant by downhearted? They're sad. They're sad. Well, what else is there? This, I think, is a stroke of genius on Rowan's part. What's a heart made of? It's not this. <laughs> Four chambers. Hogwarts is like a heart. Four chambers. Hufflepuff, Gryffindor. Slytherin, Ravenclaw, Slytherin leaves. What happens to a heart? One chamber stops working. Uh, you go into cardiac arrest. So when Slytherin leaves and leaves them all downhearted, yes, it does mean sad. But what else does it mean? This heart no longer works like it was intended to work. It's no longer beating the way it should be beating. In other words, in order for Hogwarts to be whole, there must be Slytherins. And not only must there be Slytherins, but they must what? They must be included. Slytherins and Gryffindors have got to get along, okay? There came a morning when old Slytherin departed, and though the fighting then died out, he left us quite downhearted. And ever since the Founders' War were whittled down to three, have the houses been united as they once were meant to be? Why? Because there's only three. And four is what they're supposed to be. And now the sorting hat is here, and you all know the score. I sort you into houses because that is what I'm for. But this year I'll go further. It's now adding. Okay? Never made this connection before. Huh. Sorting hat is kind of acting like those echoes that popped out of Voldemort's wand. It's addressing the problems of here and now. Notice the brains were put in over a thousand years ago. But it's 
presently aware. Listen closely to my song. Though condemned I am to split you, still I worry that it's wrong. What does he mean, split you? You go into Gryffindor, you go into Hufflepuff, you go into Ravenclaw, you go into Slytherin. Is that what he means? It's partially what he means, clearly. What else does he mean? He means, though condemned I am to go on you and split your personality to determine, oh, look at that, 50.1% bravery, Gryffindor, even though it might be 49.9% cunning. Notice the options for Harry. Slytherin, Harry wants Gryffindor, Gryffindor. Hermione's going to tell us later on, it wanted to put her in Ravenclaw. She wanted to be in Gryffindor. Okay? Though condemned I am to split you, because that's what the hat has to do to every individual to determine where they should go. Unless the person just says, oh no, I just want to go. But we don't hear about all the others who choose which house they go. Though Malfoy is pretty clear, you know, the hat just kind of needs to get close. Yeah. <laughs> Though I must fulfill my duty and must quarter every year. And notice, by the way, the term the hat uses to describe what its charge is. Condemned. What does that mean? It means I'm damned. I am damned to split you. It's, it's kind of judgment has been placed upon it to do this. All right? Though I must fulfill my duty, I must quarter every year. Still I wonder whether sorting may not bring the end I fear. Know the perils, read the signs. The warning history shows, for our Hogwarts is in danger from external deadly foes. And we must unite inside her, or we'll crumble from within. Is the Sorting Hat talking about Dolores Jane Umbridge? To an extent, yes it is. And what she represents, the Ministry of Magic. What else is it talking about? Voldemort, the greater <coughs> danger and evil. The Ministry of Magic, you know, it's kind of like, a, to use kind of Tolkienian language, finger on the hand of Sauron. You know, it's not much without Voldemort being back there. Okay? The hat stops speaking, becomes still. Ron's like, huh, branched out a bit. Do you think Ron has even heard a word the hat has said? No, because no, this is Ron. And, it's longer this year. Yeah. So it starts sorting, and we get introduced to, in a moment, come on, thing, to Dolores Jane Umbridge, which we're going to skip. She gives her big, long bureaucraties speech. And now I want to skip to um. <laughs> Harry says. The Sorting Hat wants us to be friends, and Nearly Headless Nick talks about some things from the past. Okay. And Hermione interprets it for Harry. She says it means the ministry's interfering at Hogwarts. Okay. Harry goes up to his dormitory that evening, and what happens? Just slips in his jammies and goes on to bed. Seamus Finnegan, what about him? Doesn't believe Harry. What do we see? The proof of the sorting hat saw. Okay. The ministry, the daily prophet, is sowing what? Discord, division. So that now we have, in a single dormitory room, discord creeping. Okay. Right. 
Watch. Um, Neville pipes up and supports Harry. And I'm going to skip a bunch again. Let's go to... They have Umbridge's class. Describe Umbridge as a teacher. <laughs> she sucks. <laughs> okay. I shouldn't ask them. Any of you education majors? <laughs> She's like far too many education majors. What does Umbridge emphasize? Theory. Over? Why? Why does she emphasize theory over practice? Safer, sort of. Not really. Not in the long run. If you don't know what to do, it's like in theory, you can't change anything. Take this approach to teaching and learning how to drive a car. You've read the operator's manual of the car, and you've read the rules of the road and the laws. And then for your very first time driving is your driver's test. <laughs> You're going to survive the driver's test? You're going to pass? You're even going to get out of the parking lot or back out without hitting the cars on either side of you? Probably not. If it's a stick shift, you're dead in the water. <laughs> if you've never done the practice before. Okay? So, what happens in their... That's not what I want to do. What happens in their first defense against the dark arts lesson? Harry, you know... Well, Hermione starts it. But Harry doesn't shut up. And he finally is on his feet, and he says, that's a lie. Voldemort killed Cedric. He gets detention. He gets sent off to McGonagall. That's not what I have to do. And what does McGonagall do? What does she tell him? Other than giving him cookies, he's like, what the? What does she tell him? Watch your back, Harry. She tells him, you must learn to control your temper. Remember the other day? I said, this idea is just about controlling metaphor for this book, self-control. Okay. Dolores Jane Umbridge is giving him lessons in self-control. How? She's pushing all the right buttons. And Harry's just letting her kind of control him. Um... So he has detention. He cuts himself unintentionally. Um, chapter 14, Percy and Padfoot. What do I want to say there? Percy sends Ron a wonderful letter of brotherly advice from older, smarter, wiser <laughs> brother to younger, stupid, dumber brother. Um, chapter 15, we get the Hogwarts High Inquisitor. Chapter 16, we get in the Hogshead. Let's jump to chapter 16. No, take that back. Go to um, chapter 14, Percy and Padfoot, for just a moment. When they're talking with... Harry's talking with um, Sirius. Harry and Ron and Hermione are. And Harry talks... Harry mentions something about Dolores Jane Umbridge. And he says she's foul enough to be a Death Eater. Siri says, I know her by reputation. I'm sure she's no Death Eater. Harry, she's foul enough to be one. Yes, but the world isn't split into good people and Death Eaters. What does Sirius mean by that? He means just because you're not good doesn't mean you're automatically a Death Eater. In other words, you can be good and still be a rotten, foul person. Okay? 
Um, Sirius talks about the anti-wolf legislation and such that she composed. So now let's go to the Hogwarts High Inquisitor. No, sorry, in the Hogshead, chapter um, 16. Because Hermione's come up with the wonderful idea of Harry teaching them defense against the dark arts. And then we had the big long scene where Hermione broaches the topic and Ron goes, now there's an idea. And Harry's still being Harry and clueless. What's an idea? You teaching us. Why do Ron and Hermione think this is such a good idea? Harry said the most experience. Okay. Why else? They're not going to learn from Umbridge. They're not going to learn anything from Umbridge. Okay. Why does Harry think it's not a good idea? Okay. But why does he argue against it? What does he say? It's all luck. He says you can't prepare for this kind of thing. And he just launches into this tirade against it. Ron and Hermione just kind of, you know, in awe. And they're like, yeah, but Harry, that's why you ought to be teaching us. Okay. To at least give us the tools, you know. So, Harry agrees. And they go off to the Hogshead. And Hermione says, just a few people, close friends. Um, Harry's like, I'm not sure about this when they go into the bar because it's kind of a dodgy place. And Hermione says, just a couple people told them to be here about now, I'm sure. They all know where it is. Oh, look, this might be them now. And how many are there? I haven't counted up, and I don't know if that's what my these footnotes are telling me. Yeah, 25 plus Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Okay. A couple people. So, what are at least some of them, Zachariah Stundy, therefore? Or Zachariah Smith? What are they there for? They want the scoop. They want the National Enquirer version of what happened to Cedric Diggory. Harry says, you're not going to hear it. Okay. But he does agree to teach them. And what kind of teacher does he turn out to be? A decent one. How do we know? Neville, Neville does an expelling armor's curse. First lesson. Harry's back's turned. But still, he did it, right? Um, skip a bunch again. So we get another educational decree. We have Dumbledore's army, the lion and the serpent. You know, um, Quidditch match. Ron becomes kind of the savior. We get Hagrid's tail. I'm trying to skip a lot. Um, chapter 21, The Eye of the Snake. It's just before Christmas holidays. Harry goes to sleep, or goes to bed, and he has a vision. But it's not a vision. He tries to make clear to Ron and then McGonagall when she comes. This wasn't just a dream. What did he see from The Eye of the Snake? He saw himself. He see what's the snake. Attacking Arthur Weasley. Where was Arthur Weasley? Where at the Ministry of Magic? The Department of Mysteries. Does Harry know that? No. He doesn't know where he was. Okay. So, jump to... Notice, I'm skipping all the stuff with Cho. Um, Jump to chapter 22 at St. Mungo's. Yeah, we'll do that. So, just before they do the port key, Dumbledore asks Harry some questions. How did you see it? Harry explains. 
and Dumbledore obviously believes him, puts a bunch of things into motion, and sends them to 12 Grimmauld Place. Just before he says three, he and Harry look at each other, eye to eye. Harry has his overwhelming desire to reach out and bite him. Weird. <laughs> and he doesn't quite understand it. Okay. They get to Grim Old Place. They find out Arthur's going to be okay. And the next morning, they go off to St. Mungo's, Christmas on the Closed War. And Arthur, you know, trying some alternative healing therapies, let's say, meaning muggle healing. And I'm trying to find the right place. Before they go back to a second time to the hospital, Harry goes up to his room. Fred and George pull out their extendable ears, their first time on the closed ward. All right, St. Mungo's. Harry, uh, Fred and George pull out their extendable ears and they give a set to Harry. What does he hear when Moody and Molly and the others are in with Arthur Weasley? He hears Moody say something. about Voldemort possessing Harry. Harry just kind of takes the ears off and walks away a bit. And Harry goes back to 12 Grimmauld Place. He goes up to his room and he just kind of stays away from people. And he thinks, that's it, I've got to leave. Why? They're in danger while I'm with them. And Phineas Nigellus' portrait starts to speak to him. And he essentially calls Harry a coward. Harry says, I'm not doing this for me. Oh, I get it now. You're being noble. You know, we Slytherins, we aren't noble. We just, you know, we do what's best to save our skin, etc. And Harry says something, and Phineas Nigellus just kind of launches to him about Harry's little pity party that he's having, that Dumbledore hasn't let him in on all of his grand plans. If you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, there's a scene when Frodo asked, Gaul, uh, asked Gandalf fairly early on, well, how much do you know? And Gandalf's kind of like, who the hell do you think you are? Asking me, how much do I know? Okay, first of all, I'm a lord. I'm a wizard. I've been around here a thousand years plus. And you're a piddling little nobody. Also, he doesn't say this, and you have to read the Silmarillion to understand it. I'm a Maya. I'm a god, you puny little, you know, thinking of Avengers, you know. I'm a god to you, puny little ant. Frodo's kind of like, oh, sorry, didn't mean to, you know. Phineas Nigellus is trying to get across. Dumbledore's got lots of pieces in motion, little boy. You are one piece of the puzzle. Okay. Maybe you should do what? Maybe Harry should show what to Dumbledore? Respect? Trust. Show a little trust. So, uh, Jenny finally gets Harry to see he can't have been possessed because he doesn't have hours at a time that are blacked out from his memory. He hasn't been doing things he can't remember. Um, Sirius tells Creature to get out. And then the next day, they go back to St. Mungo's. By the way, in case you're curious, over near Moonraker Point, down one of the side streets, there's a building with a door that says St. Mungo's on it. Okay? It's a place that helps the homeless or something like that. St. Mungo is the name of a Scottish saint. So is Hedwig. Okay. So, they meet Gilderoy Lockhart. 
which I find kind of interesting because she never does it anymore. She never brings Lockhart back up later. We, we, you know, he never... They go by Broderick Bode. And then Ron sees Neville. And says, Neville! They hear, oh, Mrs. Longbottom, are you leaving already? Harry's head spins around. And Ron yells, Neville! Neville jumps. It's us, Neville! Friends of yours, Neville dear, says his grandmother. Neville just, you know, wants to slink into the ground. And she looks, she comes up to them. She says, of course, I know who you are, Harry Potter. Why? Because she can see his scar. She says, yes, yes, I know who you are, of course. Neville speaks most highly of you. You two are clearly Weas Weasleys. Red hair gives them away. Know your parents well, not well, of course. But fine people, fine people. You must be Hermione Granger, Hermione Sinkin. She looks startled. Yes, Neville's told me all about you. Helped him out of a few sticky spots, haven't you? Where have we heard that Hermione has ever helped Neville out of sticky spots? Yeah, okay. I wasn't thinking about potions. I was thinking other kind of sticky. Yeah, but that would be a sticky spot for Neville. Yeah. Okay. He's a good boy, she says, but hasn't got his father's talent, I'm afraid to say. She says this right in front of him. And she jerks her head in the direction of the curtains in the back. What, says Ron? Is, you, is that your dad down at the end? What's this? Haven't you told your friends about your parents, Neville? Takes a deep breath. It's nothing to be ashamed of. You should be proud, Neville, proud. They didn't give their health and their sanity so their only son would be ashamed of them, you know. Neville, I'm not ashamed. There's a difference between ashamed and what Neville is. What is Neville towards his parents? Let me put it this way. What is Neville from his parents' perspective? I'm shaking your head. They don't really know him. Well, you've got a funny way of showing it. My son and his wife, she turns haughtily to Harry. Haughtily. Why is she speaking haughtily? What is she taking from what happened to Frank and Alice? Pride. Glory. My son and his daughter were tortured by Lord Voldemort's followers. Not his son. Not his son. My son. We're tortured into insanity by you know whose followers. Hermione and Jenny do this, they can't believe it. Ron is trying to look over the curtains. He wants to see what insanity looks like. They were Aurors, you know, very well respected within the wizarding community. Highly gifted, the pair of them. I, yes, Alice, dear, what is it? Okay, here's a question. Shouldn't Hermione know? Think of Hermione. She reads everything. Is this information the Ministry of Magic buried? So Alice comes out and down the hallway, down the walkway. Neville's mother had come edging down the ward in her nightdress. She no longer had the plump, happy-looking face Harry had seen in Moody's old photograph of the original Order of the Phoenix. Her face was thin and worn now, her eyes seemed overlarge, and her hair, which had turned white, was wispy and dead-looking. There's not much of it there. She did not seem to want to speak, or perhaps she was not able to. That's what happens with Alzheimer's. But she made timid notions toward Neville, holding something in her outstretched hand. Notice, she comes down, and of all the people that are right here, Neville, Mrs. Longbottom, Harry, Ron, Hermione. So there's five people at least. She goes up to Neville. It hands him something. Again, says Mrs. Longbottom. Very well, Alice dear, very well. Neville, take it, whatever it is. But Neville had already stretched out his hand, into which his mother had dropped an empty 
Tubal's blowing gum wrapper. Notice, he doesn't have to wait for his grandmother to give him permission. He's already taken the thing that his mother has given him. Very nice, dear. Pats his mother, Mrs. Longbottom, pats Neville's mother on the shoulder. And Neville says quietly, thanks, Mom. His mother totters back. What day is this? What has Alice Longbottom just done? She's given Neville his Christmas present. Okay, This should be a tear-jerking moment. That's what Rowling intends for it to be. Why? What is she showing us? Alice isn't all the way gone. What do we see? We see a thin thread of connection still. Notice the difference between Neville's grandmother's response and Neville's response. Thanks, Mom. Neville, put that raptor in the bin. She must have been given you enough of them to paper your bedroom by now. Okay, we're talking about a paper gum. Gum wrapper. So how many of those has she given them? Hundreds? Thousands? How many times has Neville been to visit his parents on the closed ward? Every break, every Christmas, maybe every day that he's not at Hogwarts? Enough for him to get, to get thousands of them. He has to have been there every day. Okay. And what does Neville do? Why? It's still a gift from his mom. Notice, it's a piece of trash. Walk with a five-year-old down the street. And a bottle cap can become a treasure. A rock can become something magnificent. A piece of broken glass can become a jewel. It all depends on what? First day of class. Perspective. Neville's perspective is not broken. Neville's perspective is not jaundiced. Neville's grandmother's perspective is jaundiced. It's jaded. She, she doesn't have an open heart. Neville? Yes, he does. They leave. Hermione, I never knew. Ron, nor did I. Ginny, nor me. Harry, I did. <laughs> Saw what happened to Neville's parents. Dumbledore told me not to tell anybody. <coughs> That's what Bellatrix Lestrange got sent to Azkaban for. Using the Cruciatus curse on Neville's parents until they lost their minds. Hermione, Bellatrix Lestrange, let's see, where have I heard that name before? Oh yeah. You mean that horrible woman that creature has a photograph of in his bed? Hmm. Maybe creature isn't such a wonderful little house elf after all. Okay. Um. Then we see Snape come and tell Harry he has to take occlumency lessons. Harry wants to know why Dumbledore won't do it. Snape doesn't answer. Notice we see Snape and Sirius about get into, well, I just about get into it. And what is Snape doing with Sirius there? Yeah. Pulling his chain. Think of Sirius as the big dog. Heal. Heal. Dumbledore wants you to heal. You know, Snape. Sirius is about ready to go kind of full wolf on him, not just big dog. Um, going to skip a bunch. Lupin tells Harry, you know, you need to do it. You need to do the lessons. Snape is a master at occlumency. We're not told necessarily why, per se. And so Harry has his first occlumency lesson. 
And Harry says, oh, so Voldemort can read minds. You have no subtlety of heart. You do not understand fine distinctions. It is one of the shortcomings that makes you such a lamentable potion maker. The mind is not a book to be opened at will and examined at leisure. Thoughts are not etched on the inside of skulls to be pursued by any, perused by any invader. The mind is a complex and many-layered thing, Potter, or at least most minds are. Kenny smirks. I love that line. It is true, however, those who have mastered legilimency, or legilimency, whichever pronunciation you want, are able under certain conditions to delve into the minds of their victims and to interpret their findings correctly. The Dark Lord, for instance, almost always knows when someone is lying to him, except when he doesn't. Major, major, major plot point when Voldemort doesn't realize who somebody's lying to him or when somebody's lying to him. When is it? Who else? You said I think Major. Narcissa in the book seven. And he's not sitting there going, I'll clip it to you, I'll clip it to you, I'll clip it to you. Or the Gilliman's you. Narcissa, he's dead. She's BSing through her teeth, man. Why doesn't Voldemort know? I, the Dark Lord knows. I always know, he says. Except when he doesn't. Even when Harry, at the end of the book, Harry tells him the complete truth. Yeah, I know. He has a harder time breaking into Harry's mind at that point because Harry now understands how everything works. Okay? But Narcissa, he ought to be able to read like an open book. Do we get any indication that Narcissa is necessarily a really powerful witch? Is Draco a really powerful wizard? No. Is Lucius? Only when he has other people around him. Lucius is the quintessential textbook definition of a bully. He only does something when he has others behind him to support him. He doesn't act on his own. At least Barty Crouch Jr. acted on his own. At least Peter Pettigrew acts on his own when he tricks Bertha Jerkins into taking a nice little walk in the Albanian forest with him. Okay? So, Harry says, so he can know what we're thinking right now, sir? The Dark Lord is at a considerable distance. The walls, grounds, guarded, blah, blah, blah. Harry, then why do I need to learn occlumency? Because the normal rules don't apply to you, Potter. In other words, the walls and grounds don't mean anything when it comes to you. Why? Does Snape know why? At this point, does Snape know about the Horcrux? No, he does not. Okay? That doesn't come till Dumbledore, Dumbledore says, Harry's going to have to kill him, but he can't kill him until certain things are happen. Okay? So, that's not what I want. So, Harry and Snape talk back and forth. And Snape takes some thoughts from the pensive. And he tells Harry, stand up, we're going to do this. And he gives Harry an instruction. You must remain focused. Repel me with your brain. You will not need to resort to your wand. Uh, sorry, that's too far. Um, Harry says, you're not telling me how. Clear your mind, Potter. Let go of all emotion. How? How does he clear his mind? Have you ever been told, clear your mind? You know, it'll help you sleep at night. Just sit there. So you sit there and go, be clear, mind. Be clear, mind. And now what's going through your mind? I'm not clear. <laughs> relaxed, but I'm not relaxed. I'm tense. I can't get just. He's not told how. But notice, let go of all emotion. We've seen that before. To have no desire. In other words, imperious yourself, as it were. Okay? But Harry's really angry at Snape. So Snape. looks into Harry's mind, and what does he see? He was five, watching Dudley writing 
a new red bicycle, and his heart was bursting with jealousy. He was nine, and Ripper the Bulldog was chasing him up a tree, and the Dursleys were laughing below on the lawn. He's sitting under the sorting hats, telling him you do well in Slytherin. Hermione lying in the hospital wing. Hunter Dementors closing in. Cho closing in. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an accident. Soul sucking, you know. <laughs> Harry, no, you're not going to see that. He feels a sharp pain on his knee. Okay. Harry, did you see everything I saw? Flashes of it. To whom did the dog belong? My Aunt Marge. So what has Snape just gotten a view of? Harry's childhood. What kind of view did he get? What kind of upbringing did Harry have? Not a good one. Not a great one. He was abused. He was tormented. He was neglected. What's this showing us? Not too terribly different. Might Snape kind of, I don't know, I'm probably grasping at straws here, feel a little empathy for Harry as a result? Yeah, you should. You would hope so. So, Snape says, not bad. For, for a first attempt, that was not as poor as it might have been. You managed to stop me eventually. You must remain focused. Repel me with your brain. You will not need to resort to your wand. Notice. Repel me with your mind. And what do you not need? Magic. I'm trying, but you're not telling me how. Clear your mind, Potter. Let go of all emotion again. Okay? This time, Harry sees Big Black Dragon. Father and mother waving him out of the mirror. Cedric Diggory lying on the ground. No! You're not trying. You're making no effort. You're allowing me access to memories you fear, handing me weapons. Harry, I am making an effort. Empty yourself of emotion. Yeah, well, I'm finding that hard at the moment. <laughs> then you will find yourself easy prey for the Dark Lord. So if having strong emotions makes you easy to pray for the Dark Lord, then what does the Dark Lord do? He feeds on them. Okay. Fools who wear their hearts proudly on their sleeves, who cannot control their emotions, who wallow in sad memories and allow themselves to be provoked this easily. Weak people, in other words, they stand no chance against his powers. How does Quirrell define weak people? Those who don't seek power. Okay. How does Snape define weak people? People who don't show what? Self-control. Those too weak to seek power or people who don't show self-control. What's the difference between those two? The second one is self-control. What's the first one, really? Those who seek power are seeking what? Control of, control of others. Control of others. Tolkien, in, a, in the fairy story essay, defines magic as the domination of wills and things. Domination of wills, the Imperius curse, and things. Wingardium Leviosa, Levicorpus, etc. Okay. Harry, I'm not weak. Then prove it. Control your anger. Discipline your mind. Where does Harry prove it? Book seven. When he walks into the Forbidden Forest. And again, in the Great Hall, when he talks to Voldemort and said, so essentially it comes down to this. Who's the master of the wand? I'm the master of one. It's, it's not working for you tonight, is it? It's not doing what you asked it. You don't believe me? You think today's your lucky day? I mean, he's kind of going all dirty hairy on him. Let's, let's do it then. 
right? He's watching Uncle Vernon hammering the letterbox shut. A hundred Dementors coming across. He's running along a windowless passage with Mr. Weasley. Drawn near to the plain black door. Harry expected to go through it, but Mr. Weasley led him off to the left. And now Harry's like, I've been there. I know what that door is. Snape. When Harry asked, what's in the Department of Mysteries? What? I said, what's in the Department of Mysteries, sir? Why would you ask such a thing? Because that corridor I've just seen, I've, I've been dreaming about it for months. I've just recognized it. It leads to the Department of Mysteries. I, I think Voldemort went something from, I've told you not to say the Dark Lord's name. Many things in the Department of Mysteries, Potter, few of which you would understand, none of which concern you. I'll make myself plain. What's he saying? You don't need to know that. Okay, so what does Harry hear? I need oh, to I know that. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, he tells Harry, you are to rid your mind of all emotion every night before sleep. Calm it, empty it, make it blank. You understand? I'll know if you've not practiced. So, does Harry practice? No. Ever? Of course not. Why not? Other than because he's Harry and Snape's given him an order and you know. <laughs> so why else? He wants to see. He wants to know. He wants to know. We start to see that in this book. Harry has a has a need to know. He's seeking what? Truth. Not only about himself, though it is largely about himself. He's seeking truth about other things. Okay? So, next chapter, Beetle at Bay. Um, what does Hermione get Rita Skeeter to do? And why? Okay, to get Harry's story out there. Okay. Where are they going to publish it? Why not in the Daily Prophet? Because the Daily Prophet's corrupt and is run by the Ministry of Magic. What does Rita Skeeter think about having it published in the Quibbler? Okay. What kind of story does Rita Skeeter want to write? The Skeeter-ish story. <laughs> You know, embellish and lie. What kind of story does Hermione make her write? Like, interview, verbatim. What does Dolores Umbridge do once the quibbler comes out? Thinking, well, then no one will read it. I, I issued a ban. No one will read it, therefore. And what happens? And the Quibbler sells out for the first time ever. And Luna's dad has to run a second printing. All right. What does Harry do in the article? What does he say? I saw Lord Voldemort come back. He killed Cedric Diggory. Boo-hoo. That's it. No, he names names. He names the Death Eaters. Okay. He gives all the details. Why? Because it's details that make things realistic. Then we get, I'm going to skip a bunch again. Seen and Unforeseen, Centaur and the Sneak. Let's go on to, which is when, you know, uh, Trelawney gets sacked and Ferenc gets hired. And Ferenc says about some nice things about Trelawney, about what she taught was a bunch of nonsense. Um, and then we get Snape's worst memory. Okay. Oh, actually, I have to go back. Um. Back to the previous chapter. 
seen and unforeseen, where the DA is outed, caught, well, Harry's caught, and we see Fudge, we see Umbridge, we see Percy, and Dumbledore takes all the blame for the DA. He says, tonight was to be the first meeting, blah, blah, blah. Harry says, no, Harry, be quiet. And Dumbledore says, when Snape says, You'll now be escorted back to the ministry where you will be formally charged and then sent to Azkaban to await trial. Ah, yes. Yes, I thought we might hit that little snag. Snag? I see no snag, Dumbledore. Well, I'm afraid I do. Oh, really? Well, it's just that you seem to be laboring under the delusion that I'm going to, what is the phrase, come quietly? I'm afraid I'm not going to come quietly at all, Cornelius. I have absolutely no intention of being sent to Azkaban. I could break out, of course. It's the sheer audac audacity of Dumbledore. But what a waste of time. And frankly, I can think of a whole host of things I would rather be doing. Like knitting his wool socks, probably, or something. Right? Dumbledore says, don't be silly, Dollish, as he notices Dollish, you know, twitching. I'm sure you're an excellent or seem to remember you achieved outstanding in all your nudes, but if, what's he doing there? I taught you. Put it away. But if you attempt to er, bring me in by force, I will have to hurt you. Fudge. So you intend to take on Dollar Shackable, Dolores, and myself single-handed, do you? Dumbledore. More than appeared, no. Not unless you are foolish enough to force me to. McGonagall. He would not be single-handed. Oh, yes, he will, Minerva. Hogwarts needs you. Enough of this rubbish. Dollish. Shackable. The streak of silver light flashed around the room. A bang like a gunshot. The floor trembled. Hand grabbed the scruff of Harry's neck, forced him down on the ground as a second silver flash went off. Notice, are we told Dumbledore even flicks his wand? Coughing in the dust, Harry saw a dark figure fall to the ground, crash in front of him. Shriek, then no. Dumbledore, are you all right? McGonagall, yes. Dust was clearing. And what do we see? Fudge, Umbridge, Kingley, Dollish, motionless on the floor. Fox is soaring overhead. Dumbledore says, I had to hex Kingsley just to make it all look good. Okay. So, he tells Harry, you must study occlumency as hard as you can. Do you understand me? Do everything Professor Snape tells you. You'll understand soon enough. When is soon enough? Now. Now. So, Dumbledore leaves. Who's now headmaster? Head miss inquisitrix this. Whatever. Headmistress, head inquisitrix. Okay? Um, so now I'll go on to, if I ever teach this again, I'm going to use print books. On to Snape's worst memory. Harry goes off to another occlumency lesson. There's a loud noise. Malfoy comes to get Snape. Snape leaves, and just before Harry walks out of the room, he sees this eerie glow. 
he's seen that eerie glow before. He knows it's a pincel. He goes and he looks into the pincel. Notice what it takes to go into the pincel. You have to break the plane of the water or whatever the liquid is in there. It's kind of like through the looking glass because the water acts like a mirror. Harry goes through. He realizes it's Defense Against the Dark Arts, Owls. He hears Flitwick's voice. He turns and he sees his father. Okay. The memories that Harry is seeing are from whose perspective? Where should Harry be then? I mean, think about this. What should he see them from? Snape's eyes. Where did he see everything in Chamber of Two when he read the book? Was it literally from Tom Riddle's perspective? No, it's like Tom Riddle was the director. This, this is the director's cut of Tom Riddle's memory, as it were. Okay? Because... Harry moves. Where does he move from? Go back to the beginning. There he was at a table right behind Harry. Harry stared, Snape the teenager, had a stringy pallid look about him like a plant kept in the dark. Hair was lank and greasy, etc. And Snape's down here just scribbling away. So Harry is by Snape's desk. Harry moves. Now, he's beside his father's desk. Did Snape see James at his desk? Excitement exploded. It was always looking at himself, but with deliberate mistakes. James yawns, usually rumples up his hair, makes it even messier. Harry sees Sirius give James the thumbs up sign. Sirius lounging in his chair at ease, tilting it back. You know, he's just being cool jock in the room. Okay. He looks over, he sees Lupin, there's Wormtail, so now he sees them all. Quills down, they leave the hall. Where should Harry be if he's seeing it from Snape's perspective? He should be with Snape. So, I don't know that this is a flaw in the writing or a flaw in the conception. Because it's like you can jump into these memories and view them from however you want. But a memory is something shaped, you know, comes in through your eyes, so to speak. It gets shaped on here, up here. Anyways. She actually has addressed that. In an interview or in Pottermore? I think she addressed it in an interview. She said that the Fincy wouldn't have much use if all you still see it through your own perspective. The whole idea was that it was a, kind of a magical recreation of the event, so you could actually get a different perspective. But okay. she never explicitly says it. She doesn't books. say that in the books. Other than, you know, as I said the other day, it's a sieve. So that you can sift your thoughts. Think of it like an Etch-a-Sketch, you know. You can... I still think there's an issue there. Anyways, where does Harry do? He goes off after his father. I mean, he wants to know what dad was like. In serious. So. Yes, I'm not allowed to. <laughs> I didn't say Siri. I said serious. Okay. So. They start to talk. And. Harry watches. Snape is still, you know, buried in his exam questions. Um, they go out by the lake. Harry looks over, and there's Snape sitting in the grass. So he's, he's kind of keeping Snape in eye. And he sees Lupin pulls out a book, sits against a tree. Sirius looks at the other students, rather haughty and bored. Very handsomely so. James playing with the snitch, letting it get away and then catching it, letting it get away and catch it. 
I think James Franco would have been a good series at kind of this age. Okay? Siri, put that away, will you, before Wormtail wets himself. Sna uh, Snape, if, uh, James, if it bothers you, serious. Now look at what he says. I'm bored. Wish it was full moon. Okay, this is fifth year. They've just this year learned how to become animagi. Fully doing it. Wish it were full moon. Why? Because then Lupin would go all werewolf crazy and we could transform and have a lot of fun. Lupin, you might notice darkly from behind his book. Why? He doesn't have Wolfsbane potion yet. It's not a pleasant experience to transform. We've still got transfiguration. If you're bored, you could test me. He holds out his book. Serious. I don't need to look at that rubbish. I know it all. Oh. This will liven you up, Padfoot, says James. Look who it is. What's he doing? Points out Snape. Look. Playtime. Ah, Snivelous. Snape was on his feet again, stowing the owl paper in his bag. Emerged from the shadows of the bushes. All right, Snivelous. Snape acts so fast that, as though he'd been expecting an attack. Though he doesn't have his hand on his wand, he has to reach in for it. But Snape's wand flew 12 feet. Notice what James does. It's, it's like signature Potter spell, Expelliarmus. Impedimenta. So Snape panting on the ground. James and Sirius advancing on him, wands up. James looking over at the girls. Wanting to make sure they see how the exam goes, Snivelly. Serious, I was watching him. His nose was touching the parchment. There'll be grease marks all over it. People laugh. You wait. You wait. For what? And James does scourgify. So soap bubbles start coming out of Snape's mouth. Leave him alone. One of the girls from the lake. Harry sees his eyes. Harry's mother. All right, Evans, says James. The tone of his voice was suddenly pleasant, deeper, more mature. <laughs> All right, Evans, you know. <laughs> Leave him alone. What's he done to you? Well, it's... And this tells us pretty much everything we need to know about James Potter. It's more the fact that he exists. What's he telling us? What's Rowling telling us about James? <laughs> kind of an asshole. He was a real jerk. He's saying, I'm going to torment him. Why? Because he's there. Is there any difference between that and the Death Eaters lifting up the Roberts family outside the Quidditch World Cup? No, there's not. None at all. You think you're funny. You're just an arrogant bully and toe rag, Potter. Leave him alone. I will if you go out with me, Evans. Extortion? <laughs> go on, go out with me. I wouldn't go out with you if it was a choice between you and the giant squid. And yet, this is fifth year. Three years later, they're married. She starts going out with James the end of the next year. Sirius is going to tell us. Okay. Sirius, bad luck, prongs. Oi! Snape moves. Too late. Does Sirius catch him? And what do we see? We see... S <laughs> we see Snape hung upside down exactly like the Roberts family. His robes falling over his head to reveal skinny, pallid legs and a pair of graying underpants. And people just start laughing. Lily, however, is now furious. Let him down, certainly. Lily now has her wand out. Leave him alone. What do we know about Lily from a later book? What was she especially good at? 
potions, a slughorn says. I think you're confusing Lily with Ginny. Ginny is good at charms. The bogey, fat bogey hex, which she uses on the train. I, Evans, don't make me hex you. Take the curse off him. There you go. You're lucky Evans was here, Snivellus. I don't need help from filthy little mudbloods like her. Fine. Wash your pants if I were you, Snivellus. Why is it Snape's worst memory? Within the context of this book, and not what we come to know later? Is it because of what James does? That's what we know later. From this book, it's because of this whole interaction. It's because of what James does to embarrass him. Book seven, James is nothing. It's because he used the word. I don't need help from filthy little mud bloods like her. Did he mean to say it? He said it. He had to admit it. Did he really mean it? No, because we get the implication from book seven. He immediately tries to take it back. And she's like, yeah, but self, the people you hang out with, who are they? Avery. Avery, not McNair. Crab, Goyle, Mouth. It's the whole gang, right? Having fun, Harry feels himself being pulled up. So, been enjoying yourself, Potter? No. Amusing man, your father, wasn't he? I, I, you'll tell nobody. And he says, you'll never come in this office again. We're not doing occlumency lessons. So, Snape gets a little glimpse into Harry's background. Harry gets a little glimpse into Snape's background. What other glimpse did Harry get into Snape's background? we didn't talk about. Another occlumency lesson. What did Harry see when he used the Protego charm? A young boy in a corner crying while what was happening? Father was yelling at his mother. A young boy in a dark room doing what? Bzz, shooting flies out of the sky out of the room air. What did that scene do for Harry regarding Snape? How about this? It humanized him a little bit. Did Harry know anything about Snape's background before then? Nope. But what is he seeing? Not much different than mine. He hasn't seen the Dursleys arguing. What has he seen? The Dursleys yelling at him. Do we know why Snape's father was yelling at his mother? No, we don't. What do we learn happened, however, at some point? Okay, and what did his father do? He left. He left. Interesting how many, I brought this up in a class last spring, because it's the first time I thought about it. We're going to see in, what is it, book seven or book six? Book seven. We're going to see the marriage of Fleur and Bill, right? Anybody remember any of the actual vows? Bonded for life, we're told. Is this bond like an unbreakable vow? You know, what happens if you break the unbreakable vow? Yeah. You die, okay? I don't know if it is or not, but we never hear, ever, books one through seven, we never hear, see, etc., the word divorce. 
we do have a lot of broken families, and I mean broken, single parent. I don't mean, I'm not saying single parent families cannot be good. Okay? I'm saying within the context of the novels, two parent families are always, or almost always, better. Where are the broken families? What happens to Tom Riddle's parents? Not Tom Riddle Sr., Tom Riddle Jr. Dead leaves. Mom dies. What happens to Snape? Dead leaves. He's left with Mom. What happens with Hagrid? Mom leaves. She's a giant. <laughs> He's left for dead. Those are the only three that I can think of. Seamus only mentions his mother. He doesn't talk about his father at all. Dad's a mother, that's right. Okay. But we never hear that, you know, they have formal divorces, per se. It's the others just take off. And who are those who take off? Tom Riddle leaves Maribel. He's not bound, possibly. Snape's father leaves. Okay. Hagrid's mother leaves. Is she bound by wizarding law? She's a giant. Muggles aren't bound by wizarding law. But are witches and wizards bound by some kind of unbreakable vow? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um... So, skip a bit more, because I need to get to the important stuff. Um, career advice. There's really one good thing about career advice. It's when McGonagall and Dolores Umbridge start, you know, going at it over Harry. You know, McGonagall, if it's the last thing I do, he's going to become an Auror. Does he become an Auror? It's not in the books. It's not in the epilogue. And I don't think it's implied, at least from what I've read about Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. It's like he's some low-level ministry official, is what I have read. I don't, I'm not positive. I mean, that's literally, that's what I've read in a couple of reviews. Okay. Yeah, you'll get the book on Saturday or Sunday. Um, Gromp, which I'm going to skip. They're owls. And then out of the fire. What does out of the fire imply? Into the frying pan. Uh, what's the fire? that they go out of. What happens in Harry's history of magic owl? Falls asleep, has a dream. What's the dream or vision? Sirius is being held in the Ministry of Magic. He's going to be tortured to death by Lord Voldemort. Okay. So what does Harry come up with? What's he going to do? He's going to go to the Ministry of Magic. Okay. Who stops him? And how? Hermione. How? She finally comes out to saying it. Mary, you got a bit of Messiah complex, man. You think you're a savior. I mean, okay, so you've been saving people a lot. What does she attempt to get him to do? Louder. Think it through. Think it through. What else? Proof. Get proof. Okay. What's the proof he gets? They go to whose office? They go to Umbridge's office. They use the flu. They speak to Creature. Creature says, Master is left. Master will not be returning. <laughs> you know. For Harry, that's good enough. They get caught. Umbridge comes in with Malfoy and the others. 
What does she do? And what does she do? Okay, she asked the snake for Veritaserum, but the snake doesn't have any more, he says. Cruciata's curse? Hermione says, stop, I'll tell you where, into the fire. What's the fire? Is the frying pan there in Umbridge's office? And then they leave from there and they go off into the Forbidden Forest. What happens in the Forbidden Forest? Okay, Grop comes, all the centaurs come, and Umbridge gets her what? Her comeuppance by referring to them as filthy half-breeds. And they kind of lift her up like this and let's take her off into the forest. A bunch of centaurs. You know anything about centaurs from Greek mythology and stuff? Centaurs and women. Off into the forest, the whole herd of them. And I think when we next see Dolores Jane Umbridge, her hair isn't all nicely coiffed and stuff. It's kind of, you know, sticking out a little oddly. Um, so we get the Department of Mysteries. Who goes? And why? Got to get this finished. Who goes? Well, who goes off into the Forbidden Forest? Obviously, the Triumvirate, Harry, Ron, Hermione, Jenny, who's lucky, and Neville. Why did Jenny, Luna, and Neville go? Okay, they were with them. Okay, they got the wands. Why else? Because these three want to go by themselves. <laughs> Was it all for nothing? Was Dumbledore's army merely for show? You know, and Harry's probably going, okay, okay, okay. You know, Jenny, we can let go. Yeah, Luna, Neville, really, come on. We'll leave you here as a, what, a scout. <laughs> you can... You can let us know somehow. No, Neville goes. Okay. Important? Why? He proves he's capable. Okay. He's not necessarily technically capable in terms of all the spells he uses. But what does he have? Resilience. Several of you wrote about resilience on that first. Um, come on, brain work. Field trip paper. Man. What else does he have? Think of the Sorting Hat song. He has heart. He is full, four square in it. He's got a. He's not going to back off, okay? So, they go into the Ministry of Magic, and they go down to the Department of Mysteries. Large circular room, doors all the way around. Um, let's see here. They. Go into the first room with a big glass tank of deep green water. Ron, what are those things? Brinny, Ginny, are they fish? Luna, ooh, aquavirius maggots. Hermione, no, they're brains. Okay. So the first room they go into is the brain or 
mind room. Okay? Wonder what they're doing with them. Okay, they're in the Department of Mysteries. All right, Harry, this isn't the right room. We need to try another door. Well, and there are other doors here too. Harry, yeah, but I went through that dark room into the second one, so I think we should go back there. So they go back into the round room. Hermione makes a mark on the door. Door clicks shut. They go to another room. All right. This one larger than the last, dimly lit, rectangular. And in the center of it was sunken, forming a great, great stone pit some 20 feet below. So they go into this room, and it's got like steps going down to the floor. And then on the other side, steps coming up because it's a circular room. Down here, there's like a little dais with you know, steps leading up to it. And on it is an arch, and hanging from the arch is a curtain. Harry, who's there? No answering voice, but the veil continues to flutter. There's no wind in this room. There's no air conditioning, but the veil is moving. Hermione, careful. Harry scrambled down the benches one by one. He looks at the archway. Veil is moving. Serious? He had the strangest feeling there was someone standing right behind the veil on the other side. Gripping his wand very tightly, he edged around the dais, but there was nobody there. So here he walks around it. He sees the dais from the front perspective, and then he walks around and says, huh, nobody there. But that veil is still moving. All that could be seen was the other side of the veil. Hermione, let's, let's go. This isn't right, Harry. Come on. Let's go. She sounded scared, much more scared than she had in the room where the brain swam. Maybe that's what the first room is. But the archway had a kind of beauty about it, old though it was. The gently ripping veil intrigued him. He felt a very strong inclination to climb up on the dais and walk through it. That's the first room they go into. What's the second room? It's the death room. Notice, something in Harry says, come on, Harry, walk through. Go through. Let's go, Harry. Okay? Okay. But he doesn't move. What are you saying? He hears whispers. Nobody's talking, Harry. Or might have said, Harry, you're losing it. Why? Because this is what defines and describes Hermione. This is why she doesn't have any fear in this room. She understands brains. She understands smarts. Death? Death cannot be logically understood. Someone's whispering behind there, Harry says. Is that you, Ron? Ron walks him around the back. He says, I'm here, mate. Can anyone else hear it? Luna, I hear them too. <laughs> you know, probably smiling and... Probably you know. It's not reassured. Yeah, and Hermione's like, great, you and the stoner. <laughs> <laughs> Joining them around the side of the archway, gazing at the swaying veil. There are people in there. What does she mean? Okay, the archway is kind of like this. She's looking at the side of the veil. How thick is the side of the veil? That. <laughs> she says, there's people in there. Hermione's like, wait, a little bit of reason says, unless you're on flat land, there's nobody inside there. What do you mean in there? Hermione says. There isn't any in there. It's just an archway. There's no room for anybody to be there. Ah, logic. Room. 3D space. There's no room for somebody to be there. Harry, stop it. Come away. She grabs his arm. Why? Because Harry's walking closer. <laughs> Harry, Harry. We are supposed to be here for serious Serious. Yeah. Why does Harry say Sirius's name again? 
Okay. What's happening to Harry? The longer he's in this room, he's being entranced by this thing. This thing is calling him. I think it's an echo, folks, of the mirror. When he sees, when he looks in the mirror, notice he doesn't just see his family. What's he see? Himself surrounded by it. This is his opportunity. He can be with them all. Okay? So, they leave that room. They go inside the circular room. They go to another door. It's locked. So, let's say third door is locked. What do we come to learn that door is later? It's a room, Dumbledore, who says, whose door is always locked. Then why do they have it? Why is it a room in the Department of Mysteries if you can't get in it because it's always locked? Okay. So they go back into the round room. Notice Hermione tries Aloha Mora. Harry tries Sirius says little magic. This opens all doors lock, all doors knife, and it doesn't. Right? So they open the next door, and there is dancing, sparkling light. He sees clocks all over. What room is this? It's not the clock room. It's time. You know, try and sit and think about time for a moment. Again, it's something that is unfathomable. Right? Here he says, this is it. They run down, and eventually, where do they get to? The Hall of Prophecy. And Malfoy shows up. Senior, not junior. And they have a nice little battle. We're going to skip a whole bunch. They see the on the prophecy. Uh, come on, Dave. Why are you doing this? SPT to APWBD. Dark Lord and question mark. SPT. Sybil, I don't remember her middle name, Trelawney, to Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, Dark Lord, and... Nope. Originally, it was Dark Lord and Question Mark. Because we come to find out it could apply to two different people. Harry Potter gets added later. When does Harry Potter get added? After Dumbledore tries to curse Harry Potter. Uh, Voldemort tries to curse Harry Potter. Sorry, I'll do that a lot. So, Harry pulls down, takes the prophecy. They have the uh, big battle. We're going to skip a whole bunch. How, how are the members of the DA doing against the Death Eaters? They're 15 years old. They're holding them off. Do they really need the Order of the Phoenix to come? Yeah, they do. <laughs> In fact, not just the Order of the Phoenix. They need the big guy. You know, Dumbledore, not Hulk. <laughs> okay. Though Hulk would be good. Puny little god kind of a... Puny little wizard. Wham, 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 wham. That'd be a cool mashup, you know, think about that. So, Dumbledore shows up, and what do we see again? I don't want to anger Albus Dumbledore, you know. Um, I'm trying to get to the next chapter, just about. 
We go back into the death room. They see Dumbledore. Only one couple were still battling, apparently unaware of the new arrival. Harry saw Sirius duck Bellatrix's jet of red light. He was laughing at her. Come on, you can do better than that. And the second jet of light hit him squarely on the chest. And she did better, and Sirius was being too cocky. You know, kind of as usual. The laughter had not quite died from his face, but his eyes widened in shock. What's the eyes widened in shock mean? She got me. I think that's what, it, it's not a killing curse. It's a jet of red light. I think mean, he can't believe that she's hit, that she hit him. What else? It actually doesn't say what color the second jet of light is. It just says the second jet of light. Um, you're right. Second jet of light hit him squarely on the chest. Okay. It's really ambiguous. And he seems, he sees Sirius. And Sirius just, you know, like a swan cliff diver off the Close of Acapulco just goes, goes, goes. And he sank, sinks through the veil. Harry saw the look of mingled fear and surprise on his godfather's wasted with handsome face as he fell through the ancient doorway. Notice, fear and surprise. Harry yells, serious, and he runs, and he goes around to the backside, and there's nothing there. So Harry runs after Bellatrix. And what does he try on her? Okay, He tries a Cruciatus curse. And she says to him, uh, finding the exact words, never used an unforgivable curse before, have you, boy? You need to mean them, Potter. You need to really want to cause pain to enjoy it. Righteous anger won't hurt me for long. She's describing Harry's anger there as righteous. That is, this is holy anger. This is rightfully placed anger. Here, let me show you how it's done. We're going to see Harry use a Cruciatus curse. Book 7. He uses it on... Which one is it? Electo Caro, I think it is. The one who spits in McGonagall's face. And he says, shouldn't have done that. And he's like, oh man, she was right. You really have to, you really have to want to do it. It's almost like here is like, whoa, that feels really good. Yeah. Okay. Voldemort shows up. Harry says, Voldemort's not going to be happy when he realizes you lost the prophecy. Okay. And Dumbledore comes out, puts the little protection around Harry. And Dumbledore and Tom start to talk. It was foolish to come here tonight, Tom. Horrors are on their way, by which time I shall be gone and you dead. He sends a killing curse and Dumbledore, we're told, just flicks his the force of the spell that emanated from it was such that Harry, though shielded by a stone guard, felt his hair stand on end as it passed. And this time Voldemort was forced to conjure a shining silver shield. The spell, whatever it was, caused no visible damage but a deep gong-like sound. Gong -like sound. You do not seek to kill me, Dumbledore? Above such, above such brutality, are you? We both know there are other ways of destroying a man, Tom. Merely taking your life would not satisfy me. It's a slightly darker perspective on Dumbledore. You're quite wrong. There is nothing, he says, worse than death. Dumbledore, you're quite wrong. Indeed, your failure to understand that there are things much worse than death has always been your greatest weakness. What are some of those things much worse than death? Other than, obviously, the Dementor's kiss. Because that's not what he's talking about. 
That's not what Dumbledore is talking about. What is a thing worse than death? Think of his last bit of advice to Harry Potter in book seven. Don't pity the dead, Harry. Pity the living who live without love. Pity the living who live without love. And what we tend to want to do is we want to make, you know, images in our mind of these great grand kind of images of people who live without love, like Voldemort. Do we, do we need to do that? Where do we see daily basis? You can't avoid it in London. The homeless. I can't avoid it in Murfreesboro, even. 120,000 people. We've got more homeless than I ever saw growing up in San Jose, California, Silicon Valley, which had a million people. Never, ever saw homeless in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Ever. I see on average 10 to 15 homeless people a day, different people in Murfreesboro. I see probably 20 to 50 here, depending on what part of London I'm in. Pity those who live without love, Dumbledore says. Voldemort tries to kill him again. Okay, and Voldemort takes control of Harry. His scar burst open. He knew he was dead. Locked in the coils of a creature with red eyes. And Harry hears the creature speak. Kill me now, Dumbledore. Blinded and dying, every part of him screaming for release, Harry felt the creature use him again. If death is nothing, Dumbledore, kill the boy. Harry, let the pain stop. Is he only talking about this particular specific pain? No. No, he's not. Let him kill us. End it, Dumbledore. Death is nothing compared to this. And I'll see Sirius again. What? What does Harry mean, I'll see Sirius again? Because in 50 pages, or thereabouts, after that, I don't know, actually, maybe more like 200, because I remember how much fluff there is in this book. When he goes and he talks to Nick, and then he talks to Luna, and Luna says, well, it's not like you're never going to see him again. He's like, really? What are you talking about, Luna? It's just another one of your crazy head. He doesn't have a clue what she's talking about. And here, he's kind of like, and I'll see serious. Why? We'll both go where the dead people go. Wherever the dead people go. Because it's like Harry has no understanding at all. Like he's never heard of life after death. And as soon as Harry's heart fills with emotion, the big snake goes. Okay? So, Dumbledore tells Fudge. Fudge is like, well, look here, Dumbledore. Dumbledore, you know, makes a portkey right in front of him. And essentially flipping him off. Fudge, shut it. You're not in charge anymore. And we get, finally, the last prophecy. Notice, Harry's in Dumbledore's office. He has time to himself. Why? Why does Dumbledore give him half an hour, essentially, to himself? Louder? Calm down a little bit? Why else? Process what's happened? What does Harry think? I got serious killed. My fault that Sirius is dead. Because what's he assuming? I went, Sirius followed. True? Yeah. <laughs> did Sirius have a choice? Yes, he did. Okay. So, Dumbledore tells Harry, I know how you're feeling. No, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. <laughs> There's no shame in what you're feeling, Harry. On the contrary, the fact that you can still feel pain like this is your greatest strength. Harry's like, really? Really? You want to tell me that now? <laughs> My greatest strength? You haven't got a clue. You, what don't I know? I don't want to talk about how I feel. 
Suffering like this proves you're still a man. What does Dumbledore mean? Louder? Well, what about this, though, that we've heard about so many times? Apatheia. Not feeling, not caring, not desiring. Dumbledore is not saying that this isn't good. He is saying it's your ability to suffer that makes you human. Our society, American society, I won't talk about English society, tries to do what with suffering? All suffering, no matter what the level or extent, the suffering of a hangnail to the suffering of a child dying of cancer or something else. I watched Lone Survivor last night. Phew, talk about suffering. And I've got a friend who is in the Marines, fought in the Battle of Fallujah, been through hell and back. PTSD? Yeah. Talk about suffering. Okay. Then I don't want to be human, Harry says. If this is what makes me human, no, I don't want it. I'll end it right now. Why? Harry's thinking suffering isn't worth it. The pain isn't worth it. Harry thinks he's suffering now. He hasn't begun to know suffering. Where does he suffer the greatest? Rain mentioned it the other day. When he goes to his parents' grave and he feels nothing. He feels nothing. He knows they're dead. They can do nothing for him. He can't even, you know, look in a mirror and have Because even if he had the mirror there, I don't think Harry would see his mother waving at him. I think he'd see a big, giant middle finger at him. Because that's what he thinks at that point in the seventh book the universe is doing to him. It's flipping him off. It's saying, you're nothing. And then you die. Okay? Harry, I don't care. I've had enough. I've seen enough. I want out. I want it to end. I don't care anymore. Picks up a table, starts just starts destroying the office. Dumbledore, you do care. You care so much you feel as though you will bleed to death. I don't. You do. I don't. You do. And Dumbledore says, by all means, keep breaking all my stuff. Why? I have too much stuff to begin with. What's Dumbledore saying? Get it out. You're allowed to feel this way. What else? It's not our stuff. That's imp Our stuff means nothing. Stuff meaning this stupid thing, this stupid thing, this stupid thing. Look at the people on the street. You think they go home from out there begging to nice little apartments? No, they don't. I've got a guy, friend of mine, two years ago, fat, dumb, and happy. Had a good job, had a good income, made probably fifty, sixty thousand 60000 a year. Overnight, loses his job because of downsizing. And within six months, homeless, on the street. Quadruple bypass surgery, while still homeless. Just last night, two nights ago, gets kicked out of the homeless shelter he's in because he's allergic to the cleaning solution that they force everybody to use to help clean the shelter. He's been in and out of the hospital for the last two months. He finds out allergic reactions to this stuff because he can't use the cleaner out literally on the street. No place. Okay? But, he and I have had several conversations. The more you get rid of, the more you lose richer we become because what no longer happens you're no longer weighted down by all this stuff what's going to happen to Harry by the end of book 7 he's not weighted down to 
anything. What does he lose? That's the heaviest thing, metaphorically, that he owns. His wand. It's only when he loses that he reaches bottom and then he starts to cry, climb back up like the phoenix. Okay? So, Harry, let me out. Not until I've had my say. Why does Dumbledore want to have his say? What does he tell Harry? You need to let me speak because then, if you're going to kill me, you at least have really good reason. Because you're not nearly as mad as you ought to be. Here's the... Wait a second. Pause for a moment. I'm, I'm really burning mad. And you're saying you're going to pull out the Ronco lighter fluid and just go... Whoosh, you know, stoked it. Yep, that's exactly what I'm going to do, Harry. It's not your fault that Sirius died tonight. He says, it's partially my fault. I won't take full blame. Why? To take full blame is to take all agency away from Sirius. Why does Dumbledore take blame? What does he say he did? What can you not do to especially people? Big black dogs don't like little small cages. I know, I have a big black dog, 130 pound black Labrador, does not like cages or harnesses of any kind. Okay? Dumbledore is saying he tried to put a leash on Sirius. What was Sirius's one job in life? after James and Lily died. Protect Harry. If it was the last thing he was going to do, it was protect Harry. Dumbledore should have known that. Okay? So, Dumbledore finally says, Harry, I owe you an explanation. An explanation of what? You know that first year you came and you asked me a question at the end of the year? I said, and I wouldn't tell you then. So I thought I could tell you the next year. And he gives a long speech. He says, in the end of your first year came, and what happened? Man, you shouldered a grown man's burden. You overcame Voldemort again. Ah, you're too young then. So your second year came, and you did it again. But you're, you're still too young. See where I'm going here, Harry? Does Harry ever see where he's going? He's completely clueless. Okay. So, Dumbledore talks about Sirius and Creature. And he finally gets to saying, You don't see the flaw in the plan? Okay. Well, I should have recognized the danger signs then. I should have asked myself why I did not feel more disturbed that you had already asked me the question to which I knew one day I must give a terrible answer. So he says, you, you don't see, Harry? You still don't see the flaw in my brilliant plan? No. I cared about you too much. What's he mean? You had a hell of a first year, Harry. <laughs> you showed up at school kind of skinny, kind of ragged, baggy clothes. You haven't had a good upbringing. So, you know, I wasn't going to burn you. And then your second year, you know, you, you got a knack for getting into trouble, kid. I wasn't. Third year, really. Stop now, please. Fourth year, you see Voldemort come back. I cared more for your happiness than your knowing the truth. More for your peace of mind than my plan. More for your life than the lives that might be lost if the plan failed. I acted exactly as Voldemort expects, we fools who love to act. What does he mean by we fools who love? What do we fools who love do? We make irrational decisions based on love. 
What does that mean? We make irrational decisions. Okay. What else? We want to protect those we love. Screw <laughs> those we don't know about. What's he saying? Harry, I wanted to protect you. Yeah, even if it meant some nameless, famous people in the future would die. He protects Harry. Who are some of the nameless, faceless people in the future who die? Serious. In the future from book one. Serious. Who else? Cedric. Remus. Thomas. Dobby. There's a lot of names. But Harry Potter needs to be kept happy. Until now. So. He says. Voldemort tried to kill you when you were a child because of prophecy. He knew the prophecy had been made. He did not know its full contents. Sun's fully risen now. Harry. Uh, I, I broke the Threw it to Neville. Neville. Come on, Neville. Dumbledore. It's okay. I heard it. I retained it. Whoosh. Voila. Yeah. There it is. Did it? Did did that? What did that mean? He knows what it meant. He's not that stupid. It meant that the person who has the only chance of conquering Lord Voldemort for good was born at the end of July, nearly 16 years ago. This boy would be born to parents who had already defied Voldemort three times. Me? Old thing is, old boy, it might not have been you. It might have been Neville. And he's like, yes, let it be Neville. <laughs> Notice what part he's not paying attention to. The Dark Lord would mark as his equal. Then it might not be me. No, it's you, but no, you're forgetting this part. But he might have chosen wrong. What's Harry mean? Harry means the prophecy might have implied. There might have been small claws written in really small print there somewhere. Actually, I mean, no, hold on, but I'm he chose the boy he thought most likely to be a danger to him. And notice this, Harry. He chose not the pure blood. He chose one like him. The half blood. Harry, why? Why did he do it? Why did he do it? What did Voldemort not hear? That part. That he would mark as his equal. Pardon? But he just hadn't chosen. Or, if he tried to get more information, my, when I teach literature, I always define tragedy as an instant when a person has got to make a decision, but yet they don't have all the necessary information to make the right decision. In one sense, what does that mean? Almost every decision you make can become a tragedy. How often do you have all the information? You choose a major. You don't have all the information. You choose to go to college. You don't have all the information. They don't tell you. Admissions reps and stuff don't tell you. Oh, well, this piece of paper is not going to mean anything, actually. <laughs> it's not going to mean anything. Forty years ago, that piece of paper meant... You have a job, not anymore, period. It doesn't matter what your major is. It doesn't guarantee you a job at all, okay? <laughs> Happy thoughts. Yeah, try a uh, spectro screw on them, you know, because that's what I'm getting. I'm getting screwed from the inside and the outside. So, Dumbledore says... The person who heard it only heard the first part. Harry, but I don't. Because Dumbledore says, 
No, go back. The end of the prophecy. It says, um, it says something about neither can live while the other survives. Oh, sorry, not where I wanted to be. Back further. Voldemort never knew there might be danger in attacking you, that it might be wise to wait or to learn more. He did not know that you would have power the Dark Lord knows not. Harry, I don't. I couldn't do what he did tonight. I couldn't fight the way he did tonight. I can't possess people or kill them. And that's when Dumbledore says, uh, Harry, there's a room in the Department of Mysteries. The door's always kept locked. Contains a force at once more wonderful and more terrible than death. Notice, more wonderful, wonderful, awe-inspiring, and more terrible, more fearsome than death. Than human intelligence, than forces of nature. It is also perhaps the most mysterious of the many subjects for study. It's the power held in that room that you possess in such quantities on which Voldemort has not at all. Dumbledore says Voldemort has no love whatsoever. Luke Skywalker tells his father, Father, I can still sense the good in you. Darth Vader doesn't say, No, you're wrong, Luke. I'm evil incarnate. He says, It's too late for me. Meaning, you're right, son. There is still a little teeny tiny bit of good in you, in me. But there's more dark. That power saved you from possession by Voldemort. So that's when Harry says, so the, the part at the end, <laughs> one of us has got to kill the other? Yes. Okay. And that's when Dumbledore says, oh, by the way, the reason I didn't make you prefect, I thought you had a bit much on your plate already. Second war begins, the news comes out, end of year feast comes, Harry goes and talks to nearly headless Nick. What about? Death! You're dead! You know? Nick's kind of like, well, yes, I am, kind of. Harry sees the two-way mirror, come on, thing turn. Uh, Nick says, I was afraid of death. I chose to remain behind. I sometimes wonder whether I ought to have. Oh, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> kind of like me. Neither here. He's not fully corporeal. He can be frozen, but he can't eat. Nor is he there. He didn't what? He didn't go on. I chose my feeble imitation of life instead. Harry felt almost as though he had lost his godfather all over again. So what kind of emotional standpoint is Harry at this point? He gone to, he'd gone to Nick hoping to receive some hope. And what does Nick do to that hope? <laughs> he shatters it into a billion pieces. He walked slowly and miserably back up through the empty castle Wondering whether he would ever feel cheerful again. And what happens? He bumps into Luna. So, full of despair and sadness. Oh, lost most of my possessions. Notice how Luna puts that. I've lost most of my possessions. Really? She just kind of scattered them around, not knowing. No, she hasn't lost them. What's happened to them? People have taken them and hidden them. People take them and hide them, you know, but as it's the last night, I do need them, so I've been putting up signs. And Harry's odd feeling arises in him, an emotion quite different from the anger and grief. How come people hide your stuff? Oh, well, I think they think I'm a bit odd, you know. <laughs> Some people call me Looney, Looney Lovegood, actually. Harry looked at her and the new feeling of pity intensified rather painfully. What kind of pity? Is he merely, merely, 
merely feeling sorry for Luna? Or is this the other kind of pity? Is this really sympathy he's feeling? That's no reason for them to take your things. Do you want help finding them? Oh no, they'll come back. They always do. In the end, it's just I wanted to pack tonight. Notice Luna's approach. She puts the signs up, and what? She's not going to go looking for them. Why? Everything will turn out in the end. Describe this. What does Luna have that Harry doesn't have? Faith. faith. Luna has faith. It's not faith in God, per se. She just has faith that things will turn out the way they should turn out. Okay? Harry, when she asked, why aren't you at the feast? He didn't feel like it. She says, oh, the man the Death Eaters killed, he was your godfather, wasn't he? He nods. Harry, who have you seen that's died? Well, my mother, quite extraordinary. One of her spells went badly wrong one day. I was nine. I'm sorry. Yes, it was rather horrible. Still feel very sad about it sometimes. But I've still got dad. In any way, it's not as though I'll never see mom again, is it? Isn't it? Says Harry uncertainly. Notice the adverb. Uncertainly. What does that mean? Without certainty. Without assurance. Harry doesn't have the assurance, the, the certainty, that Luna does. And yet, when he was being possessed by Voldemort, it just kill me now, Dumbledore, because then I'll be dead. The pain will be over, and I'll be with Sirius. Maybe all he meant then was, and I'll just be dead. <laughs> Whatever dead is. She shakes her head. How? In disbelief. Her disbelief is not in her belief. Her disbelief is in Harry. How in the world could you not believe this, Harry? She seems to be saying, well, come on. You heard them? Just behind the veil? Didn't you? Notice, what she heard behind the veil does what for Luna? Gives her hope. What else? I think I heard it over here. It reassures. It fosters her assurance. It gives her certainty. You mean... Harry's not sure what she means. In that room with the archway. They were just lurking out of sight, that's all. You heard them. Notice that's not a question. That last statement. It's a statement. You heard them. She heard Harry say, Who are you? What are you saying? And Harry asked, Does anybody else hear them? I do. Come on, Harry. We both heard these voices. They looked at each other. Luna was smiling slightly, meaning she has that kind of lost look on her face. Harry did not know what to say or to think. Luna believed so many extraordinary things. Yet he had been sure he had heard voices behind the veil, too. You sure you don't want to help me look for your stuff? Oh, no. I'll just go down, have some pudding, and wait for it all to turn up. It always does in the end. That's her certainty. That's her assurance. Okay. Things work out well. She walks away from him, and as he watched her go, he found that the terrible weight in his stomach seemed to have lessened slightly. What has Luna just given Harry? Hope. A lot? Is he now walking around, skipping downstairs, because he has a firm, certain, certain, assured belief that all will be well, that he and Sirius will be united, that he and Mom and Dad will be united, in the great never after, and it'll be like a giant Hogwarts, and you know, God will be like a smiling double. No, he doesn't have any of that. What does he have less of? 
that he had when he first met Luna here. Less pain, less despair, less doubt. He has more hope. How much more? We don't know. It's more than he had before. How much hope did he have before? He felt like he would never be cheerful again. That's not much hope. That's... If you don't have a feeling like you will ever be cheerful again, well, what kind of what does it describe you as kind of within the novels? Dementor kissed. That's kind of what it's described as. But she's planted a seed in here. Okay? So we get the end of the year. I don't think there's really anything much left to talk about. Um Lupin and the others are going to have a talk with um, the Dursleys, and we get the beginning of the next book. We have eight minutes. We won't go into a lot. How does the next book begin? Say that again. The other minister. Who is the other minister? Uh-uh. The other minister is not the Muggle Prime Minister. It's the magical one. We begin with the Muggle Prime Minister in what's going on. It's right after the bridge falls. It's not his first night in office. We do hear about his first night in office. After he's elected, what happens? You know, the one picture goes all funky and <laughs> says a uh, message from the Minister of Magic and Fudge comes in and says I hate to tell you this and then another year I hate to tell you this and then I hate to tell you this Fudge keeps coming in and doing what? He fudges. He fudges the truth constantly. Right? So what's, what's going on in London? It's kind of odd to teach this book summer of 2005. To have this book begin this way, and we start class three days after the bombing okay, happens. All hell's breaking loose, right? You have two unexplained murders. Emily and Vance, and who else? Anybody remember the name? Madame Bones, whom Harry met at the beginning of Order of the Phoenix. Okay? The one who was so impressed with the fact that he could conjure a corporeal Patronus. And so, Fudge comes to do what? In this one. I'm not Minister of Magic anymore. I've been sacked. or got a new one. And he meets Rufus Scrimger, who's there to tell him, you know, you're going to have protection. Kingsley Shacklebolt's going to be his protection because the other guy, Horace or something, somebody or other, we know wobbly because of what happened. So what is she doing? Why is Rowling starting this novel this way? Isn't this what we've been led to expect? I mean, think of what series tells Harry, Ron, and Hermione at the cave at Hogsmeade. Okay, imagine for a moment Voldemort's back in power. What's happening? People are disappearing. Strange things are happening. What's happening? People are disappearing. Strange things are happening. You know, the bridge collapse. It's not like in the blankety blank idiotic film. People don't see a bunch of, you know, shadowy shapes go across the Millennium Bridge. It's not the Millennium Bridge. It's a bridge that has cars going over it. Lots of cars. So that when it collapses into the river, People die. Okay. The stuff in the West Country. Hurricanes, really? London, England. We're way too far north for hurricanes. Okay. Yeah, powerful storms do reach, but not true hurricanes. Let's just stop there. We'll, um, I don't know how we'll do it, but 
we'll try to do all of, well, here's how I know how we're going to do it. Um, 